So first up, we have Paul Surrett. He teaches politics in the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. His current research focuses on, among other things, political communications, the conservative movement, and the anti-abortion movement. He's also been a researcher and strategic consultant for a wide range of non-academic institutions, including international government agencies, think tanks, research institutes, charitable foundations, and private sector companies. So let's jump right into it, and thank you so much, Paul. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, to start off with, I just want to say a big thanks to Trevor and the organizers. Uh, over the last, uh, oh, I guess, uh, 18 hours, I've been amazed at the quality of the presentations. Uh, I think uh, blown away by last night is uh, an accurate uh, description. Uh, so it's a real honor to be here with uh, the other presenters. And uh, I'm a Winnipeg boy by origin, so coming to Edmonton and arriving uh, in snow has been a real pleasure from what is uh, still gray and rainy Ottawa. I'm not joking about that. I immediately had a huge smile as soon as I uh, arrived uh, to the snow. Uh, minus 14 is nothing. So um, uh, thank you very much for having me, and I'm thrilled to be up here and uh, uh, on the same panel as, uh, as a friend and co-researcher, uh, one of the uh, uh, best researchers uh, around, Shane Gunster as well. So um, uh, what am I going to talk about today? Uh, <clears throat> in, um, uh, uh, to some degree, both Shane and I, I think, are going to uh, play the role of uh, perhaps a productive gadfly uh, and, and ask questions about some of the things that we take for granted, I think, as progressives uh, from the perspective of um, how, do we, uh, how do we become more effective advocates as progressives. Um, uh, uh, today, what I'm going to talk about, if I can find the, uh, uh, there we go, movement here. Today, what I want to talk about is reconsider the chasm. And you can see, lo and behold, a chasm visually presented. The chasm we see between uh, often things like fact and fiction, science and ideology, reason, logic, data, and truth, and emotion, and rhetoric. Um, in many ways, these binaries, these distinctions, are crucial for us as progressives because they allow us to uh, denounce many of the manipulative attempts to, uh, 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 to uh, 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 mischaracterize a reality, if uh, you'll go with me there, um, uh, uh, and uh, erase uh, what are actual facts out there. So they're important. They also help give us a sense that a different way is possible. So they're admirable and they're essential as a perspective. On the other hand, if we hold too close to this distinction, if we make it too black and white, I think it represents certain risks for us as progressives. In particular, I think it uh, encourages us to underestimate some of the more subtle techniques that conservatives uh, use in this country to persuade Canadians. And secondly, I think it runs the risk of making us, us as progressives uh, less effective in our own advocacy. So today I want to do, um, uh, hopefully, four things if we can get through it. First, I want to just outline a few reasons as to why we draw this distinction. Um, secondly, I want to highlight a number of reasons, both structural and then uh, perhaps some others that you hadn't thought of, about why these are difficult and uh, uh, distinctions that we probably don't want to hold too closely. Thirdly, I want to give you some examples of the various ways that the conservative movement actually works on both sides of these spectrums and why it's important to understand that they don't just fall into one category. And finally, and briefly, although we can talk a lot more about this in the uh, questions, um, some of the implications for uh, progressives um, for understanding this. So hopefully uh, that makes uh, a little bit of, of, uh, of sense. And if at any point I'm not clear, um, please feel free to throw up your hand and, uh, and ask me to, to be more clear. So, why do we, why, what are some of the reasons which explain why we make this hard and fast distinction between fact and fiction, uh, 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 reason and rhetoric often? Part of it is, politically, there are many reasons, but part of it is, uh, it's our democratic heritage. Uh, because for democracy, for the idea of democracy to work, uh, you have to at least believe three things. You have to believe that people can rationally identify their self-interest. You have to believe that they're able to rationally uh, compromise on their self-interest uh, with others and for uh, the greater good. And thirdly, you have to believe that you can process information in order to do the first two things. So there are different ways of um, understanding how important these elements are. But if you think back to the, uh, some of the original thinkers um, of democracy, uh, in the West at least, we think of the ancient Greeks, um, they believed all three of those things. But very importantly, they believed that they were achievements. 
They were not natural capacities uh, that they were born with. Moreover, they argued that for democracy to work, you had to make sure that the right conditions were in place. So there were certain structural challenges, the inequality of material interests, uh, the fact that masses of people can be swayed in various ways. Uh, there were certain things that had to be negotiated for democracy to work. As such, um, uh, uh, they proposed a variety of solutions. Some of those, there's no question we would not accept today, nor should we. For example, to deal with the uh, uh, problem of differences of material interests, uh, ancient Greeks just decided to get rid of a bunch of <laughs> the majority of the population. So slaves, uh, non-landed property, uh, people with, uh, without property, uh, women, uh, ethnic minorities, non-citizens, etc., were simply evacuated from the political realm and not allowed to, uh, uh, to participate. So. Uh, that's not something we want to go back to. On the other hand, they also recognized that there were uh, 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 certain things that I think remain relevant today. So they championed an idea of participatory politics. They uh, argued that you needed very specific types of uh, spaces for political deliberation with, which, with certain rules. And they also argued that you had to cultivate a series of uh, uh, virtues and emotional bonds or emotional uh, 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 connections uh, to the collectivity. So what that meant is that ancient thinkers, even if they highly valued rational thinking on the one side of that chasm, uh, they also um, uh, explicitly argued that the rhetorical arts were crucial for politics. They were crucial because they uh, allowed public discourse to cultivate emotional bonds of belonging and appartenance to the, uh, uh, to the public good, a pride in embodying certain uh, virtues, a willingness to compromise. They argued that those were emotional commitments in addition to rational commitments. So even the most rationalist of them uh, argued that rhetoric was uh, core to politics. Uh, Aristotle, very explicitly so, rhetoric was placed beside uh, uh, logic and uh, dialectics. Uh, Plato, who was a critic of uh, rhetoric in many ways, also acknowledged, he said, that rhetoric is crucial to uh, uh, open the window to um, uh, 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 men's souls, uh, to the truth. That said, they were also harsh critics of certain uses of rhetoric, right? So the sophists uh, were a version of rhetorical manipulators who used those arts for financial uh, self-advancement and in the service of power. So there was both a conception uh, of rhetoric being important, uh, but also potentially uh, problematic. And the question was how to navigate that. But it was not a black and white distinction, reason good, rhetoric bad. Now, several thousand years later, um, uh, Enlightenment thinkers, not quite as late as Habermas, but close. Um, Enlightenment thinkers kind of found inspiration in these uh, uh, conceptions about uh, democracy, but they reread them. They reread them with a highly uh, optimistic lens. And uh, uh, for example, the ability to rationally identify your self interest was reread largely, this is a slight oversimplification, but uh, reread largely as a natural capacity, not a learned achievement. The definition of self interest was reduced quite significantly to individual security uh, and or economic self-interest. In the place of an idea of collective good, we had this idea um, that uh, uh, the pursuit of individual self-interest would just you know, spontaneously uh, lead to an aggregate good. Um, active participation and deliberation was no longer required. You could outsource your political uh, uh, future by electing representatives and allowing others who were more interested to deal with it. And finally, and most importantly, the public sphere was rewritten as if it was a place of only reason. And that enlightened reason would allow us to arrive at a, pl a place of uh, a rational, uh, um, uh, egal well, not egalitarian necessarily, but certainly rational in their view, uh, uh, public policy. Um, if you don't believe in this, if this doesn't work, the modern, what you could call the thin notion of democracy that we have, it also doesn't work. So the problem with this is at least twofold. On one hand, the faith that you need in that. If, if the bulk of the population doesn't believe that, democracy really does not work. And the problem is, I would argue, the bulk of the population believes in that much, much less. Uh, 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 than perhaps once was the case and certainly that is required. Why is this the case? There are many reasons. Uh, uh, some of the speakers over the last day have focused on some of the political economy reasons and the economic interest behind it. Let me just outline a few additional ones. Um, first off, I think you can look at the way that the media frames 
politics. So I'm not a huge fan of the Game of Thrones, but I kind of like the uh, thing. Game of Thrones, for you don't know, is basically a political soap opera set in some sort of fantasy time. But it reduces politics to a ruthless game of power and self-interest. Right? And to a large extent, that is how the media now frames and pursues and covers politics. It's about the game of politics. What's the strategy? Who's winning? Who's losing? What's the next move going to be? It's much less on what is the content of the policy. That has effects, right? It's been, sh it's been shown in many studies. It changes how we think about politics and it changes uh, how optimistic we can feel about it. We, it changes what we think is actually possible within the politics. So that starts to erode some of the very optimistic, enlightened uh, conceptions. Secondly, it's not just media portrayals. These actually uh, are uh, at least uh, somewhat accurate representations of the reality of uh, the business of politics. And it is the business of politics now. Susan Delacourt, a uh, reporter for the uh, Toronto Star, uh, has just come out with a new book called uh, Shopping for Votes. Um, uh, and her, uh, the book there is basically uh, an investigation of the role that communications and marketing now plays in politics. And the short answer, no surprise, is almost everything. Just as uh, Munir Sheik said, uh, productivity might not be everything, it's almost everything. Well, uh, in politics nowadays, marketing might not be everything, but it's almost everything. Uh, you have a sense that politics is not about governance anymore, it's about uh, a permanent political campaign. Communications, financially and resource-wise, have become central um, uh, uh, to all parties. Uh, the ability to focus group before, during, and after messaging and, and respond in real time uh, uh, changes things significantly. There's an argument that wedge issues and highly ideological polarization uh, uh, is increasingly uh, uh, characterizing um, our politics as well. Uh, uh, on the right side uh, is a picture, that's Manning's new uh, headquarters in Calgary, and it coincidentally looks almost identical uh, to a firm that I worked at when I was younger called uh, McKinsey and Company, which is a strategic management firm. Uh, and uh, Manning is very clear. He says political parties don't produce intellectual capital anymore. They are simply marketing devices. Intellectual capital is now created by civil uh, society organizations, which uh, uh, political parties take up. So, uh, second reason we're cynical is because we should be cynical. Um, thirdly, it's not just that we see this in the media, it's that the political language, especially of conservative neo-populism, or which is probably a better term for it, faux populism, uh, reinforces this language intensely, right? So we've had 40 years of uh, both political parties and um, uh, media institutions and uh, uh, talking heads who reinforce the idea that the market is the ideal location of, poli uh, sorry, the, the ideal uh, uh, location of freedom and politics in comparison is but a corrupt uh, kind of vessel for uh, the most brute fight of self-interest. And politicians are simply in it for themselves. Waste, elitism, patri uh, uh, paternalistic attitudes, that is the land of, of politics. So even the political discourse we engage in, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, um, uh, reinforces uh, a lot of this. If you didn't believe the discourse, uh, <laughs> the last three weeks uh, 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 certainly highlights it, right? I mean, literally, <laughs> the pudding is out there. Um, uh, between Rob Ford and uh, Mike Duffy, I mean, you now have a decade of, of political discourse and events where every year the, a major media focus is on scandals that, that, that uh, uh, do nothing but further destroy the idea that politics can be a force for good and the political is a realm uh, uh, that is worth engaging in. Uh, and so my suggestion would be even conservative political scandals help the conservative movement because it makes people even less willing to engage and the less willing they are to engage, not just from an electoral point of view but from an ideological point of view, the easier it is to sell the idea that the market is good and politics is bad and we should not uh, engage collectively in politics. Finally, uh, uh, there are a couple of, of last things. The role of the market in our life, uh, the lived experience of the market, and the constant reiteration of the supremacy of the market has significant, significant effects on this as well. So we're living in a period where there's not only an increased salience of the economy uh, in media and in politics, which has been proven in, in many different ways, but uh, uh, an increased insecuritization and precariousness of our uh, economic uh, existence for many people. The market. I mean, now appears quite forcefully as a 
not so invisible hand that is always like a sword of Damocles posed just above your head, ready to sweep you to the side if you do not obey its dictates. Um, uh, so much better to hunker down, try to succeed as an individual, and uh, uh, surf that wave, become part of the winner-take-all economy as opposed to uh, those that are left behind it, um, uh, then engage in politics and resistance. Finally, if you look at um, the way that uh, our, our public sphere now functions, it is so uh, fundamentally characterized by commercial marketing as well as political marketing. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, people's reaction by and large to um, uh, various forms of persuasion or debate is to think, what are you selling me? Right? That's our, we're so cynical uh, to some degree that everything that everyone says, we, we read through this, this lens. So, and there's a variety of polls that, that, that suggest that that's quite widespread, especially when it comes to politics. So, uh, there are a variety of structural reasons which explain why, to a large extent, we're quite, uh, uh, as, as a political community, uh, skeptical and cynical. Um, and that makes it very hard to, uh, uh, to believe in uh, the promise of rationality. That said, progressives, as progressives, we often respond by kind of both decrying the corrupt uh, 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 contemporary situation and then both nostalgically and hopefully uh, uh, imagining a context in which public policy and public debate, both of them, uh, are, uh, are uh, run and determined according to the rules of rationality as opposed to the rules of marketing. Um, there's comfort to this vision. It's important politically. I would argue it's also insufficient because not only are there structural factors that make that very difficult uh, uh, to convince people that that's possible, but there's also a lot of evidence that suggests that it, the idea that that is um, uh, uh, a reasonable, pardon the pun, way of imagining a future politics fundamentally misunderstands how we think. It fundamentally misunderstands how the brain works. So over the last several decades, a variety of scientific disciplines have essentially concluded that in contrast to what Enlightenment theorists believe, um, that human judgment is almost invariably a combination of reason and rhetoric, uh, evaluation and emotion. Uh, one of the um, uh, most accessible and most interesting, I think, uh, overviews of this and uh, the consequences is Daniel Kahneman, who uh, is the pioneer of behavioral economics and won the Nobel Prize in, in economics. And his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, essentially makes the argument that, uh, uh, or essentially outlines what is now increasingly accepted uh, uh, across uh, the neurosciences, which is that as humans, we have at least two major ways of making judgments and thinking. Uh, Kahneman calls these system one and system two thinking. So most of us like to imagine ourselves on, the, on let's see, the left side, system two thinking. System two thinking is the slow, explicit, logical system that allows us to self-consciously weigh evidence, evaluate various options, imagine multiple uh, consequences, and make clearly thought out decisions. And it's largely located, though this is an oversimplification, it's largely located in the frontal cortex uh, and engages it, which is a, evolutionarily speaking, very recent uh, development in the human brain. Uh, on the other side, system one thinking um, is extraordinarily quick. It's almost automatic type of judgment that uses an enormous storehouse of prejudgments, pattern association, feelings, and infrasensible perceptions to literally jump to conclusions without subjecting them to explicit analysis and questioning. So according to Kahneman, and that lives uh, uh, much more in the older, the cerebrum, and specifically in the amygdala. Um, according to Kahneman, these complement each other. Both are absolutely crucial, um, but they're not equally positioned. So despite what most of us believe, uh, our system two thinking is involved in a very small portion of our everyday decisions and judgments. Uh, it takes a lot of resources, it takes a lot of time, it gets depleted very quickly. Paying attention is a correct metaphor. You pay attention, it costs you to use system two thinking. In contrast, the majority of uh, our, our, our judgments use system one. Um, it requires much less at, uh, attention, energy, and effort. It's at the core of the fight, flight, or freeze uh, uh, reactions. It's extraordinarily adept at mobilizing emotions and autonomic physiological reactions to drive judgments, conclusions, and behavior often with no input or control by system, uh, by systems two. And what's really important about system one is it makes, its it logic is based on uh, uh, associations, right? Past associations that connect ideas, experiences, emotions, and thought without a critical uh, discussion 
uh, or conception of them. So uh, there are a variety of implications for, poli uh, for politics and, and society. Ob obviously, systems two thinking has helped uh, create many of the technological advances uh, that we experience in our uh, uh, society. But system one helps explain why politics uh, 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 is often ruled by emotional issues and appeals. And that this is not just an error, a failure, a result of ignorance, or even purely caused by the structural conditions of contemporary society, but rather that it is a deeply seated uh, uh, element of our thinking. So uh, it uses those emotions, deep-seated assumptions, learned prejudgments, and physiological reactions to drive uh, our political judgment. So it s explains a couple of things about political debate. Number one, it explains why uh, uh, it's hard to win an argument with facts alone. It's not because people are ignorant, it's not because they're stupid, it's not because they're lazy, it's because it's hard work in comparison. Secondly, it helps explain why rhetoric is so inextricable from political debate. It's so important because rhetoric is the art of, um, is the art of engaging system one. Right? Rhetoric is the art of engaging system one emotions and connecting them through metaphors, through narratives, through framing techniques to get you to a place even though you don't know how you got there. So, what is the impact of this for politics? Let me briefly highlight a few. Um, so the most obvious one, uh, let me put it this way, is to say systems one thinking helps explain the conservative circus of enraged uh, 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 culture war clowns. So you've got on the top left, that's an actual picture of an anti-abortion protester in the States at the Obama, uh, the Obama um, uh, uh, inauguration, our dear friend Ezra Levant uh, from this part of the country, Rob Ford and Charles Adler. Um, and there's no question that the conservative movement has waged uh, a war on science, right? And has waged and has used a variety of systems one thinking and a very angry, dark, id version of uh, systems one thinking based on fear to drive and justify uh, their politics. Ford makes sense, and the continuing levels of Ford, even though it's shocking and surprising, it makes sense once you understand system one, and once you understand all the various associations that he triggers. Here's the complication. That is not all or even most of how the conservative movement functions, in my view. Let me give you a couple of different answer, uh, examples. First off, the conservative movement consistently uses a variety of techniques that try and engage system two thinking too. The Fraser Institute, if it matters, measure it. It's not if it, measure, if it matters, measure it well, but it is if it matters, if it measure it. Um, essentially, their entire game plan is to use the markers of uh, uh, social scientific and scientific credibility to forward uh, their position. So one example is the school report cards. Another example is the way that they make the argument about Medicare. Uh, they've stopped comparing it to the states. They are now comparing it to uh, OECD countries, uh, which is a much easier sell for them. Um, they use these markers of empirical and, and theoretical uh, credibility to make their case. It has a variety of, of, I'm not saying it's good science, it's absolutely not, but it appeals to people on the basis of looking like science. It appeals to certain demographics and it gives cover in certain ways. Um, this is also true of places you really wouldn't expect it. So the anti-abortion movement, for example, just finished a book on this, and you'd be astounded the degree to which scientific claims, so if you think the traditional image of the anti-abortion uh, movement is one of uh, a religious, irrational, anger, violence, um, often, uh, that's not how they work anymore. Not only do they apply uh, system two thinking, so they, uh, motion 312, one of the most uh, um, recent motions in parliament, is all about from a, uh, a science-based perspective. Uh, another major argument they make is uh, uh, not talking about the fetus so much, talking about abortion harms women, comparing the effects of abortion to PTSD, uh, uh, arguing that there are certain links to cancer, et cetera. So conservative movement arguments uses system two thinking as well. The other thing that it does is it uses system one thinking, but it doesn't simply appeal to fear. It also colonizes progressive, and David, I think, was talking about this in another uh, thing. It, co it colonizes progressive uh, system one associations. So they appeal to feminist identity. They talk about Alice Paul, and they make it seem like uh, uh, it's feminist to be anti-abortion. Uh, they appeal to gay rights iconography and argue that if you're in favor of same-sex rights, you must be uh, against abortion. 
They make visual comparisons between uh, feminist issues like domestic violence, and they use System 1's thinking to map that onto anti-abortion positions. And then my favorite, M408, uh, which has just become official uh, Conservative Party um, uh, policy, protect girls, stop gendercide, support M408. Traditional feminine colors combined with traditional feminist iconography, the argument uh, being if you are against gender discrimination, you should also be against abortion. It works also because of, you got it, it works also because of a series of coded racial and class um, uh, uh, underpinnings, uh, uh, which I can talk about in the, uh, uh, in the question. So it is, it is very, very smart uh, system one thinking, but very different than Rob Ford. Rob Ford gets a lot of media attention. He is far from uh, 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 the norm and the only way that the conservative movement plays on system one and two. What are the implications, finally? As usual, I'm uh, a little bit out of time. Let me just highlight a couple of things and then I'm going to sit down. Two major buckets. What does it mean for progressive discourse? Number two, what does it mean for structural changes that we should fight for at a policy level? On the progressive political discourse, we need to, uh, number one, relax the reason rhetoric distinction. Secondly, we need to understand that as progressives, we can resonate and we can educate at the same time. Thirdly, I think data is crucial, but how we present it and how often we present it is, is, is absolutely central. Techniques of visualization and constant, 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 constant repetition is absolutely crucial and we don't do anywhere near enough of it. We need system one campaigns and we need a much stronger progressive ideas infrastructure, literally of think tanks and how to get it. Last thing, it also implies a variety of structural changes. We need to fight for not just getting back the census, but a whole series of strengthening public data gathering. It's essential. We need to think about campaign finance laws. If you look at what happens down south, you lose that battle, the public uh, sphere is done. Um, think about truth in advertising, limit the government use of publicity, and then even things like proportional uh, uh, voting as a system become uh, much more important from this perspective. Sorry for the speed. Thank you very much. I'll now turn it over to Shane. Thank you so much, Paul. Those are important and uh, somewhat unsettling examples, but uh, some really great concrete actions. So thank you very much. So next we have Shane Gunster. Thank you for being here. Shane teaches in the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University. His current research and teaching interests include environmental communication with a focus on the politics of climate and energy, journalism and news media, conservative political discourse, and advertising and consumer culture. He works closely with a variety of non-academic groups, including serving as a researcher and advisor to the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. So thank you, Shane. Over to you. Great, thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's always hard to follow Paul, so uh, I will do my best here. Uh, I would also like to start by thanking uh, Trevor and the organizers of this conference. But what I'd also like to thank is you. Uh, what a phenomenal turnout. Uh, this is just mind-blowing uh, to see this many people come out for uh, this conference. So thank you uh, for being such an engaged uh, audience and for there being so many of you. This is just fantastic. Uh, so I came in from Vancouver yesterday. So the temperature change was a little more severe than it was for Paul. But I can tell you, I've got a couple of kids at home, a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. And when I send them the pictures of the snow, they think I'm the luckiest guy alive. <laughs> so I'm very, very happy uh, to be here for that reason as well. So it was great to make your kids feel jealous. <laughs> In terms of um, the speed of this, I am going to speak fairly quickly, maybe even faster than Paul, if that's possible. And that's because, like any good academic, I've prepared a 35-minute talk for a 25-minute time slot. So uh, apologies for the speed. If there's anything uh, that you want to talk about more, obviously, we should have some time in terms of questions. So today what I want to talk about is the intersection of climate science, climate politics, and communication. As Chris Hedges said last night, it's really hard to overstate the enormity of climate change, a crisis that poses nothing more than an existential threat to human civilization. And that might seem like hyperbole, probably not to too many of you in this room, but that is how climate change is increasingly characterized. And not just by the climate scientists, but also by institutions like the International Energy Agency, the World Bank, 
PricewaterhouseCoopers, you know, the usual suspects when it comes to prophecies of ecological uh, apocalypse. And it's not like we're just figuring this out now. We've had a pretty good idea about the magnitude and the severity of this problem for a long time, probably about 20, 25 years, for decades. So why haven't we done anything about it? And what can we do about it? Probably the most common response is to blame the media for their failure to accurately and consistently report the scientific consensus about the causes and the consequences of global warming. Instead, they've kept alive this view that scientists don't really know if climate change is happening, uh, what causes it or what its impacts might be. And while the quality of news reporting uh, on climate science has actually improved somewhat over the last five years or so, the volume and the prominence of news about climate change has dropped off a cliff. Even in stories where it's obvious that the connections to climate change are worth exploring, such as the recent typhoon in the Philippines, the media are reluctant or refuse to draw them. So according to recent analysis from Media Matters, less than 5%, less than 5% of articles and segments which appeared in major US print and broadcast news venues in the week following the typhoon even mentioned climate change. And there are similar patterns of omission in recent coverage of all kinds of extreme weather. Heat waves, wildfires, flooding, and so on. For some, though, the media are, mere, are uh, merely willing accomplices to those who really deserve the blame. Since the early 1990s, the fossil fuel industry, right-wing think tanks, conservative politicians have worked very hard to ensure that the views of a handful of climate skeptics, climate deniers, have received far more attention than they deserve, creating an impression of scientific controversy and debate where there is none. Manufacturing uncertainty about science has long been a favored and often highly successful tactic of corporations and their allies to block governments from acting in the public interest on a whole host of health and environmental issues. Doubt is our product. That's how one tobacco industry executive famously explained the game plan in 1969. Since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. Thing is though, if you listen to conservatives talk about global warming, and many of you may have your own experience with that, the one thing that you almost never hear is doubt or uncertainty. And that's because for the most part, they're not actually talking about science. Instead, what they're really talking about is politics. The politics of taxation, government regulation, liberal elites, free markets, consumer freedom, global governance. And those are all things that they're actually pretty sure about. And in my view, that is the most important effect, or certainly one of the most important cumulative effects of the disinformation campaigns. Not creating doubt about science, but certainty about politics. Conservatives have changed the context in which a lot of people think, feel, and talk about climate change. They've taken it out of the realm of science and put it into the realm of politics. Words and ideas take on meaning and significance based on the conceptual and the emotional networks in which they are embedded. In the associated thoughts and feelings that arise when a particular word or phrase is said. What is the meaning of climate change? Does it refer to material processes, which are transforming the Earth's atmosphere and climate system? Or is it just another excuse for liberal elites in the nanny state to raise taxes and take away your freedom? You say global warming, I hear a socialist scheme to suck money out of wealth producing nations. You probably remember that quote, Stephen Harper in 2002. In 1982, a couple of anthropologists, Mary Douglas and Aaron Woldowski, wrote a book entitled Risk and Culture in which they develop what they called a cultural theory of risk perception. They argue that how people engage with particular risks often depends a lot more on their cultural values and their political worldview than the objective characteristics of the risks. Different people perceive identical risks in very different ways, depending upon what they value in a society. Those who hold an individualistic worldview often tend to be far more skeptical and dismissive of environmental risks than others. Why? Because they think society should be structured to maximize individual freedom and personal choice. And they tend to see markets and capitalism as the best way of achieving that. 
And accepting the reality of environmental risk poses a real threat to those beliefs, because it raises the need to regulate markets, to constrain businesses, to restrict consumer choice. Conversely, those who hold a more egalitarian, progressive worldview are much more likely to accept environmental risks as valid, because they believe that's what government should do. They should play a more active role in mitigating economic inequality, reducing corporate power, and promoting social justice. And so accepting those risks confirms that view, the necessity of that view. And in North America, this polarization of risk perception, that's exactly what we've seen over the last couple of decades. Survey research consistently identifies political values and partisan identification as the most important factor shaping how anybody thinks about, or shaping what anybody thinks about climate change. Is it happening? Am I worried about it? Should we do anything about it? Conservatives say no. Liberals and progressives say yes. You can see this divergence quite clearly in the chart on the left, um, which is based on research done by Dan Kahn, a Yale University psychologist. I think the most striking feature about that chart is how it shows increasing levels of scientific literacy actually intensifies skepticism about climate change on the part of conservatives. And that suggests education isn't going to work. More information doesn't work. More facts don't work with that particular group. And as the chart on the right suggests, this polarization has only grown more intense over time. Uh, between 2006 and 2013, Democrats saying global warming is happening mostly because of human activity, 57 to 66. Republicans dropping from 31 to 24, 42 point spread. All right, so what do we do about this? What do we do about this? There's some who argue, well, we need to depoliticize and depolarize this discussion of climate change. We need to take it out of the political sphere and turn it back into a scientific issue, into a technical issue. And one way of doing that would be to double down on our efforts to inform people about the basic facts of climate change. If scientists could just communicate more effectively, if governments would just stop muzzling them and promote their work, if the media would actually give these stories, the story of climate change, the, the, the front page um, coverage that it deserves, maybe people would start to engage. A second line of argument suggests we need to abandon the polarized terrain of climate politics altogether in favor of less ideologically charged topics like renovating our energy uh, and transportation systems, investing in R&D, uh, promoting clean tech, and so on. If talking about climate change produces conflict and division, let's stop talking about it. Instead, let's talk about things we can agree upon, which have a greater potential for achieving bipartisan compromise and consensus. Now, there is much, I think, uh, to recommend about those approaches, but today I want to take the opposite perspective. I want to argue that just because conservatives beat us to the punch in politicizing climate change, that doesn't make it a bad idea to do. In fact, I think intensifying the politics of climate change can help us to communicate more effectively about it in three important ways. One, in how we communicate. Two, who we communicate with. And three, what we communicate about. So let's start with the first point. Effective political communication often starts with values, not with facts. And this is especially true in the case of climate change. A science-first approach generally assumes that the facts speak for themselves. And so the best way to communicate about climate change is to present those facts in an objective, neutral, impartial, value-free manner. Scientists often prefer this because it fits with their disciplinary norms and expectations, that that's how you talk about your research. That's how you express your ideas. I think many others have also taken this approach because they think that it enhances their credibility with audiences who might not share their political values or beliefs, but who at the very least should be interested in the facts about climate change. The problem, of course, as the cultural theory of risk perception suggests, most people don't engage with most facts in an objective, impartial, or value-free manner. That's simply not how we process information. Instead, if those facts challenge our values, challenge our beliefs, challenge our identity, then we tend to ignore or dismiss them. They bounce off of us, as George Lakoff likes to say. And this is especially true when those facts refer to complex, abstract, problems like climate change that are often difficult to grasp and that often lack a personal experiential dimension to trigger more direct perceptions of risk. So if our perception of facts and risk depends upon our values, 
then maybe we should spend more time cultivating and promoting those values that would allow people to engage with the facts in a more positive and constructive fashion. And that brings us back to culture, back to politics, which is much better suited than science for having those kinds of conversations about values, about the things that really matter to us. This slide uh, is taken from the Common Cause Handbook, which is a primer on values-based communication put together by an NGO, or some NGO practitioners in the UK. And it makes the case that given that values have an influence over such a wide range of attitudes and behaviors, and I only crammed in about half of the ones that they have uh, in the book there. Um, if that's the case, if you want to change any of those things, then why not start with the thing that drives that, that drives our attitudes and behaviors. It makes a lot of sense to start there. Now let me be really clear here. This emphasis on values does not mean ignoring the science or forgetting about the science. Instead, what it says is that by framing climate change as a political issue, you can actually generate a much deeper engagement with the facts of it. Foregrounding progressive values, empathy, compassion, equality, fairness, generosity, that establishes a context for people to connect with climate change as something that matters to them. And not simply, not simply because it threatens their own personal well-being or even that of their children, but because it represents such a profound contradiction and affront to their own moral values and their political beliefs. Outrage at injustice, compassion for suffering, empathy with the struggles of others. Those are the powerful emotions that lie at the heart of the idea of climate justice. Climate justice, an idea which is already galvanizing a global movement of resistance. Just as important as understanding the affinity between progressive values and engagement with climate change, is recognizing the difficulty, the impossibility, of fully grappling with this problem from within a conservative worldview. Two years ago, Naomi Klein developed this argument at some length in an excellent piece in The Nation entitled Capitalism versus the Climate. Climate change, she argues, detonates the ideological scaffolding on which contemporary conservatism rests. There is simply no way to square a belief system that vilifies collective action and venerates market freedom with a problem that demands collective action on an unprecedented scale. The question of values then is not simply rhetorical. It speaks to the cognitive frames through which climate change either becomes intelligible to us as something we need to address or doesn't. Or doesn't. Second point, who is the audience for climate change communication? Who are the people that we need to connect with, that we need to engage with? How we imagine our audience, how we think about our audience, drives how and what and why we communicate. It shapes the stories we tell, the ideas that we share, and the values that we emphasize. So this is a graphic from uh, work on US public opinion done at Yale University by Anthony Leiserwitz, one of the leading researchers in this area. He's been doing this research since 2008. And one, of the, one of the basic features of it, one of the things I like about it so much, is the segmentation of the public into six different groups based on their levels of belief, concern, and desire for political action. So where should our focus be when we look at that? Well, if your priority is raising awareness about climate science, then the target is probably going to be somewhere in the middle, or more likely directed at, at the whole, the public as a whole with the expectation that as people learn more about climate change, they're going to shift down the scale. They're going to shift down the scale. But if your priority is political mobilization, then your best bet, your only bet, is to direct most, if not all, of your resources to the people on the far left of the spectrum, to the alarmed. These are the people, these are people who are, quote, very certain global warming is occurring, understand its human cause, strongly support societal action, discuss the issue more often, seek more info about it, more likely to act as opinion leaders, most likely of the six groups to have engaged in political activism. These are people who don't need more science. These are people who don't need more science. I've recently been involved in terms of research with these people, and what they really need, what they really want, what they're desperate for, is politics. They know individual behavioral change isn't going to work. They know corporations aren't going to solve this problem. They desperately want their governments to do something, to take much stronger action. But what most of them don't know 
is how they, as individual citizens, can come together as a political movement to force governments to take political action. Most of this group aren't yet activists, but they're sitting right on the cusp of political mobilization. And that brings me to my final point. Communication to catalyze and enhance political agency needs to be our top priority. From my point of view, the biggest shortcoming of news media coverage of climate change isn't actually the failure to report the findings of climate scientists or giving too much space to skeptics. Instead, it's the cultivation of the cynical wisdom that there is nothing any of us can do about it. The problem is too big, it's too complicated. Special interests have too much power and influence over the political process. The public, too self-focused, too apathetic, too distracted, too indifferent. There are no meaningful alternatives. This cynicism reached its height four years ago, when the Copenhagen negotiations collapsed, which was really the last time that the media spent any sustained time on climate. The basic message then, and the story hasn't changed much since, is that our political institutions are unable and unwilling to deal with the problem. Now, at one level, that's true. That's a very accurate diagnosis of the dismal state of mainstream climate politics. But the danger is, the danger is, if all we ever hear about are the failures and the broken promises, then climate change starts to look like a fundamentally unsolvable problem. And what do most of us do with unsolvable problems and the emotions of guilt, despair, cynicism that go along with them? We ignore them. We deny that they exist. We resign ourselves to living with them. The real crisis in the public's understanding of climate change is not, I would argue, that some deny the reality of climate science, but that most have accepted the reality that politics as we know it has no answers to this crisis. And that is a function of our anemic political culture, not scientific, um, scientific illiteracy. But stories of corruption, greed, and apathy are only one side of climate politics. I'm almost done. Only one side of climate politics. There are so many other stories to be told, that can be told, that need to be told. Stories of solutions, of alternatives, of resistance and struggle. We need those stories now more than ever to provide real tangible examples of how politics can make a difference. There's no shortage of examples of countries, communities, cities, which are taking political action to shift their economies in a more sustainable direction, who are developing different ways of producing energy, constructing buildings, moving people, moving goods, uh, planning cities, creating jobs, organizing economies. All these alternatives are out there. And those stories map out what Chris Turner has eloquently described as a geography of hope invigorating the belief that another world is possible by showing us how many fragments of it already exist. But even more important than examples of uh, successful government action, what we really need are stories of political activism and political engagement, which describe how people from all walks of life are mobilizing in a thousand different ways to demand their governments do something about this crisis. One of the best ways of drawing people into politics, of firing their political imagination, of shifting them along the continuum of political uh, engagement, is through stories about how people just like them, people that they can identify with, that they can empathize with, are getting involved in politics. Those narratives help transform climate politics from a spectacle that we passively observe from the outside looking in into a site of active struggle where we actually participate, where we actually do something to shape the policies and priorities of our governments. Narrative is the vector through which the contagion, if you will, of what Chris Hedges called the sublime madness of revolt. Narrative is the vector through which the sublime madness of revolt grows and spreads and maybe even ripens into hope over time. Out in BC, the fight over Enbridge's Northern Gateway project is emblematic in this regard. Thanks to the heroic efforts of First Nations, communities which have led that fight against the pipeline. And the political mobilization of thousands upon thousands of citizens to support them, this has become 
a fight that we can win. This has become a fight that we are winning. And that, pro that, that prospect of victory, that, that intoxicating prospect of victory, that's the best possible antidote for the pervasive cynicism that uh, so often poisons our political culture. Now, talking about climate change, I don't often get to end on an optimistic note, so I think I will end there, and thank you very much for your attention. Wow, thank you so much to both of you. Um, I'm going to jump right into question period. Um, I just have a few things I want to say first. We have a very full room, so um, I'm going to try my best to uh, look for some equality around who we're picking to ask questions. I ask that people that are on the mic ask questions, and I'll try and stack uh, looking around the room and looking for sex, age, and race um, balance. So um, bear with me as I try and get to as many of you as possible. Uh, we have both of our presenters up here, so uh, I see two questions here, and we have a couple of mic runners, so let's start to there. Yes, uh, regarding car uh, climate change, it seems that in the last few years, even the right wing has sort of abandoned it, trying, except for the extreme fringes, to trying to deny global warming. And the focus now is more, more into shifting the debate into some kind of phony car, um, corporate friendly alternatives like carbon trading or some massive geoengineering projects, which rather than solving the problem will just be another source of corporate profits. So, you know, that seems to be the, the way things are going with, the, with global warming now as far as the, the rights response rather than outright denial as they used to do. I don't know, is that on? That's on. Okay. Um, just quick, yeah, no, I, I, I certainly uh, agree with that, and that's, that's a big problem. There, there are still quite a few who deny, especially if you look in the United States, you look at Australia, the Anglo-American world is just really quite striking in terms of that. So that narrative is going to continue. I suggest uh, what uh, narrative is likely, though, to displace it from a conservative point of view is, why should we do anything when China is not doing anything? Why should we do anything when India is not doing anything? Why should, etc. So it becomes that kind of trade-off. And it's another excuse not to take action, but it's a different one that uh, isn't freighted with the kind of anti-science baggage of the denial, uh, the, the denialist position. In terms of the perspectives and, and can capitalism get us out of this problem, this is the point that Naomi Klein makes, I think, very convincingly, that it can. Uh, and that requires a far more radical transformation in terms of, of actually dealing with the problem. Absolutely. Now, having said that, I will say that in terms of the on-the-ground politics around climate change, there are occasions when it is possible to drive a wedge between what I would describe as brown capitalism and a greener form of capitalism. We've seen that in California, for example, in terms of the support for some of the climate change policies of that state and the arguments around the ballot initiatives that have happened, where you have one sector of capital which funds one response and another sector of capital fighting another response. Capitalism has in part survived by dividing and conquering uh, the left for 100 years. I think we can start to play that game against them uh, to some extent. And so I wouldn't rule out those sorts of opportunities to play off different capitalist fractions against one another with the knowledge that ultimately capitalism, certainly capitalism as it exists uh, today and as we know it, ha has no ultimate answer for, for climate. Can I just, jump just quickly, it's also, <clears throat> I think, important to once you make the move to understanding that values-based discourse is really important, you start to see a lot of contradictions between conservative values and the practice of capitalism as well. And so last night, Chris Hedges, I mean, one of the ways that he appealed was from a, the point of view of a parent. And if you look at people like Preston Manning, for example, he, he's trying to make the case for a conservative version he, uh, of, of kind of market-based solutions, but taking, taking uh, climate change somewhat seriously, he gets laughed out of the room. The only way he tries to play that is by appealing to a parent-based, a kind of responsibility-based discourse, that actually engages conservative values. And to the extent that we can actually highlight that distinction, it's one way of putting pressure and trying to break that, uh, break that apart. Um. 
Um, policy consultation in Canada is becoming increasingly gated or closed with the, the civil society org organizations that get in to the, those rooms are uh, tend to be aligned with uh, corporate or industry agendas, while civil society organizations that represent the public interest are increasingly excluded. Do you see value in trying to break through that barrier and get into the those um, direct policy consultations, or do you see more um, scope for for progress in organizing out, outside of that context altogether? I'll take I'll take a first crack. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, I mean, one way to to break it down conceptually is to think about tree top tree tops and, and grassroots. And if you think about, for me, I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but. Um, investing in an ideas infrastructure in Canada for progressives is absolutely central. Part of that is should definitely be focused on driving public opinion, because in a marketing-based um, uh, political world, changing public opinion it actually has very concrete impacts. So I think part of it should absolutely be. I think traditionally think tanks have thought about dealing with the elites uh, uh, kind of structure as you produce reports, you allow them to exist out there. That's clearly insufficient in a hyper-politicized political realm, and especially one in which you've got um, uh, very tense relationships between the bureaucratic and the, and the political. So uh, to some degree, <laughs> I mean, you've, we've got a first-past-the-post voting system, which, which creates an exceptionally powerful executive for four years if they've got a majority government. Um, I think changing structurally towards a proportional uh, vote system is one of the few ways that you could actually uh, challenge that uh, moving forward. So, um, Just quickly on that, yeah, I absolutely echo that in terms of um, the, the change of our voting system. And we came so close in BC to changing that uh, a number of years ago. We're literally like a percent away in the referendum. Uh, so it can, it can be done uh, in terms of building support. Uh, in terms of uh, activism versus more traditional policy channels, from a climate perspective, certainly looking at the American experience, uh, working, trying to work through existing policy channels is, has gone absolutely nowhere. Uh, however, on the ground activism, well, we actually have seen some successes as far as that goes, right? In the sense that delaying Keystone as long as it's been delayed, uh, that's the result of activism. Uh, and, and on the ground mobilization and building all kinds of unlikely coalitions uh, against that. So that, that, uh, that's been effective. If you actually look at U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, probably the biggest uh, impact that has happened there over the last five years has been the fact that they've stopped building coal plants. And part of that is the price of natural gas. Part of that is a very active campaign organized by the Sierra Club and others against uh, allowing for the permitting of new coal facilities, and they've shut that down. That's an amazing victory in terms of actually starting to, or actually slowing greenhouse gas emissions. And so that kind of act, and I mean, if you look here in, in, in Canada, it's that on the ground activism that has, as I said, allowed for the possibility that, that uh, Enbridge might be stopped. That's not the policy process, that's, that's activism. And so when I look around, the success um, the, the, the places of success I see in terms of climate policy, it's activist. It's, it's less so in terms of uh, working within those traditional mechanisms. So that, I think, is what, is what we really need more of. Hello. Um, this is going to be a bit of a difficult point, but I'll try my best. So something that I took out of the intersection between your two talks is that for this particular issue, the rational arguments that we're used to using might be insufficient. And I agree with that in the sense that we need to use kind of more emotional, rhetorical, and cultural um, points. And I think an interesting way to look at it is that our society is coming out of a period where we were facing a different way that like our species would be exterminated, right? Like we were, we were coming out of a system in which it's kind of the same type of problem, but in that situation, no one could really do anything. We were just waiting around to see if the people in power would, would take action, right? So um, I think one of the reasons that people stick to the rational scientific arguments is that we shouldn't really need to move beyond that in this issue, right? Making a, uh, an issue of this magnitude up to political debate, up to subjectivism, it kind of, like, you should be able to say, you know, at a certain point enough is enough, we can't make this a fight that we could possibly lose, right? So, um, I just, 
the fact that we actually have to move to the political process to deal with something of this magnitude that should be common sense, does that, doesn't that kind of speak to a larger issue that our present type of de democratic system is woefully inadequate to deal with these kinds of issues? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I, and, and again, uh, with, if you look outside of the Anglo-American world, there are examples of countries where the debate, where there was no debate. There is no debate about climate science. You look at the German case, for example, they figured this out 25 years ago. When the, uh, the public came on side, there was no skepticism in the media. Uh, politicians of all ideological stripes agreed this is a big problem, we have to solve this. And they have actually made some big strides in that direction. So looking at that, it's hard sometimes not to think, well, why can't we have that? I don't think we live in that kind of world, though. It, living in a kind of Anglo-American world that's dominated by a political economy of a fossil fuel industry, which is going to do everything it can to resist a more rational debate. And therefore, I think that, that, that makes it incumbent upon us to figure out what we need to do in this political context in order to get traction. And one of the things that I try to be clear about, and I'll just emphasize again, I don't think that using values means that you dispense with facts. I think that using values actually enables for a much deeper engagement with the facts. The values tells our brain, put some energy, put some resources into this. You need to think about this because this is important. This matters to you. You care about this. And so to use the terminology that Paul was talking, it uses system one to kickstart system two. I don't think seeing the two as disconnected works. I think we have to understand how they connect and how they can reinforce each other in positive ways rather than just seeing how the one trumps the other. And I think, I mean, for me, uh, there's a part of me that agrees we shouldn't have to, but uh, the big point of my presentation was we do have to. And it's not just because of, it's not just because of cultural factors. It's not even just because of political economic interests of which there are many major ones. We do have emotional investments we have identities that are impacted by this issue. We have values that are impacted. And we have a whole series of very, very profound everyday practices, which if you take this seriously, are absolutely bowled over. And so in that sense, you know, I guess my, my response would just be, I think we have a choice. We can either resent the fact that we're emotional beings in addition to reasoning beings, beings and and uh, 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 wish that it weren't the case. Or we can say, well, I kind of wish that we were in, but we're going to engage in this way, especially with the hope. You know, in many ways, Shane's paper is, is the much more hopeful follow-up from mine, which says we can actually engage systems two through a systems one, and that it's actually a winning strategy on, on this specific issue even uh, uh, to take seriously that system uh, one as well. Um, so I've actually been working a lot on trying to communicate and mobilize people on the sort of war on science issue. And I've been thinking a lot about how I think that there, it essentially that rationality is a value for Canadians. You know, I think especially when we look at when George W. Bush was in power, there was this sense of sort of looking down our nose at them and we're better than them because we're smarter, we're rational. And, you know, that's something I really think we haven't tapped into. And that's something I've sort of been thinking a lot myself. So I would love your guys' thoughts and maybe even suggestions on how we can actually communicate rational thought as a value. Because I really do think it, it is a value of most Canadians. Uh, <clears throat> I couldn't agree more. I mean, the work that you're doing is precisely taking the idea of rationality and communicating it as a value, in, in my view. Like, I think the, the, the protesting, having scientists protesting around evidence, having doctors protesting around uh, the, the changes to refugee health care, that is brilliant because there's so much social capital in those subject positions. And when you actually bring it to a, a, a place where people are forced to think about it as a value and not just go kind of go through their daily life and ignore it, or which is often the case, I mean, and this is the Rob Ford stuff is very instructive, you get to a point where it's just overwhelming 
you can't like, I mean, I don't know if you guys are the same, but I, for the last three weeks, every day I wake up and there's a new news story and I can't believe there's more. And at a certain point, I mean, the standards are dragged so low that it, it doesn't matter what happens and the polls aren't moving in Toronto, right? I mean, 33% are gonna vote. He's not gonna win again, I don't think, but so. Anyway, all, all I would say is the act of politicizing and almost moralizing rationality as a value is so profoundly different than just saying, oh, well, I'm going to put out another report and that should be enough to persuade people that, uh, uh, that yeah, so I'm looking forward to your talk and I think that is such an important uh, uh, piece of work in Canada today. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add to that. I would entirely agree. I think it's a fantastic cam campaign. It seems like it is a values-based campaign, and I think you're absolutely right to focus on values that way. And I think one of the things that a campaign like that is really effective at doing is humanizing scientists. It's actually showing us the faces, the people uh, behind this war on science, and uh, giving them a space where they can talk about that in their own voice and with their own emotions with respect to the frustration and the anger that they feel about being muzzled and the care that they have for their work. And that is absolutely invaluable and so uh, helpful in um, destroying kind of conservative myths about uh, or conservative stereotypes about mm -hmm. scientists and science. So in terms of giving people a platform for that, giving scientists a platform to communicate in that way, absolutely brilliant and and um and and essential in terms of having an impact so excellent work okay so i completely agree with the idea that we need to not just use rationality but also appeal to the human sides of things in order to make our arguments in order to persuade people or well, using system one's thinking to kickstart systems two thinking but my question is because that is something that i try to do but sometimes when i try to do that that sort of not really weakens what i'm trying to say but in that i can't seem to say it as loudly as other people who are hardline on one side just appealing to systems one. Kind of. I hope that makes sense. And so what I'm wondering is how do we do this but have our voices equally as strong as people who just use systems one? And how does that, how do we make it so that the message is not lost, we're not seen as people who are too much on the middle ground trying to appeal to a lot of different people, trying to appeal to a lot of different things? Sure. Um, well, I, I actually, I'm, I'm not sure that I, that I would. I, it's a great question. I, I'm not sure that that I think you necessarily need to give up passion, or strength, or effectiveness, or power of voice, in terms of uh, speaking about these issues from, a va or starting with, for example, a values-based perspective. From my point of view, I actually find the most persuasive, compelling communication about climate science is precisely that which starts from that point of view. And I find that communication which doesn't start from that point of view uh, takes a while to, to, to grab, if you will, it takes a while to develop traction. So my experience has been that starting with values, and, and I mean the other thing too that I uh, this isn't quite what you're saying, but maybe I can use it to make this point. Sometimes when you talk about needing to start with values, people think, oh, it's just marketing speak, right? You're just using market research to try and figure out what the values of your audience are, and then you push those buttons, and then they'll pay attention to what you have to say. That's not what I'm saying at all. I actually think that those discussions of values need to come, they need to be genuine. They need to come from deep within. When, when in communicating about this stuff, I think we need to figure out why this really matters to us. And then we need to be open and honest about why it matters to us. And I think that actually, that grabs people. That grabs audiences. When, when you're open and transparent about why something matters to you, why it's so important to you. And uh, so my sense is that, that if, you're, if you start from that point of view, you're not sacrificing. You're, you're in fact um, enhancing your credibility and your power and your resonance with an audience. But that, I'm, I'm not sure I quite um, answered your question, but... Right. 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 
Okay, just quickly, and then I, I know Paul wants to jump in as well. Um, from my perspective, and, and there are many who disagree with this, I, I wouldn't waste my time talking to the people on the right side of the spectrum. I actually think we do far too much of that. I think we do far too much of that, and I think it tends to misunderstand how social and political change actually happens. Chris, Chris Hedges last night made a point that uh, if it only takes 5% of the population to revolt against the system, to actually start to transform that system. And I think there's something to that. Uh, I think that, the, as I said in my talk, the people who I think we really need to engage with are those alarmed, who we need to push into that higher level of, of political engagement. And it's going to take so many resources, so much time, so much energy it, to try and reach the ones on the, on the right side. And I, I don't think we have that kind of time. And I'm not sure that it, that it to use a horrible metaphor, that, there's, that it pays m many dividends to actually invest time in, in talking to that particular group. Uh, just very briefly, I'll, I'll use it as, as an excuse to say a couple of things. First off, there are real downsides to using system one uh, thinking, right? System one thinking relies on a variety of uh, prejudgments, assumed truths, uh, stereotypes. It is the reason why stealth attacks, why racist coded attacks work. So, so uh, it is it is not uh, always a happy thing, um, but uh, 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 it's important. It's part of us. And for me, what I don't think the difference should be is that progressives use reason and conservatives use rhetoric or system one versus system two. It's how you use systems one and how you use systems two. And uh, um, yeah, on that one, I think, uh, I think Shane's point about system one cannot appeal to everyone because you're about resonating. And what you want to do is you want to expand the proportion of people who resonate with your messaging, but also reach those and not worry about the ones who you can never reach. Because again, as Shane says, that's not what drives social change. I was part of community gardening in Fort McMurray for 14 years. And this year, behind my church, I had a big garden to help feed the refugees. Does this sort of thing fit in what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah we'll take three. Yeah, it's a Looking um, on television and all of the um, Canadian um, Association of Petroleum Producers uh, ads right now that I think are nailing uh, brilliantly and nauseatingly well. Um, uh, uh, system one and system two in a certain way. It's really quite fascinating to look at. So, and this is this is being repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. And so, I'd really be interested in your thoughts on what we could be doing to have that airtime um, to to also uh, look at it from the perspective that both of you have so eloquently spoken to, because I think that's also something we're going to need to do. It's huge. Hello. Okay. Um, there was a uh, a cliche, an idiom, I guess, um, in 1968 in France. Um, uh, demand the impossible. Um, so I'm thinking, um, to what extent is our envisioning a future based upon our capitalist understanding of system one and system two, which I consider to be very formal logic, and for, for sake of this argument, after the revolution, it will be more dialectical. What, to what extent are we limiting ourselves to actually getting to the place where we want to be. I can uh, maybe start with one, since I, of course, forgot to bring a pen up here, so I didn't write down the question. Well, too late. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just it, it, the the question about cap, I think, is a is a is a is a really useful one. Uh, and uh, in terms of that context. Enbridge has unleashed a $5 million advertising campaign in BC, and there was a poll that came out yesterday or the day before in the Vancouver Sun saying, surprise, surprise, 
uh, British Columbia public opinion is shifting in favor of the pipeline. Five million dollars does buy you some, you know, effects in terms of that. Uh, and I think that, you know, I think there's there's a variety of different things that I think we need to do there. One of the most effective things to do is actually to communicate about the political economy of communication, so that people start to when they see something from CAP. They know who it's from, they know what their point is, they know it's propaganda, and they don't listen to it. So it bounces off of them because of their understanding of the political economy of where, who's producing that. So they see it as public relations, so they see it as propaganda. I think it's possible to decrease the effectiveness of those organizations if you increase understanding about who funds them, what they're behind. Uh, so in the case of the Fraser Institute, for example, Defining that as a right-wing conservative think tank is one of the best ways of actually discrediting uh, and raising, raising questions about the kind of research which they're proposing. And I think we need to do the same kind of thing with uh, organizations like CAP. We could also do more in terms of uh, democratizing our media so that our media was not so uh, vulnerable and dependent upon those kinds of corporate advertising campaigns and so that we could actually get news coverage which was critically exposing those sorts of corporate advertising campaigns rather than staying quiet because they're the ones who are, uh, you know, who are um, paying the piper, as it were. So I think democratizing our media... Yeah, that's right, the anti-oil piper. Uh, so, so I think um, democratizing our media, more regulations that are around the, that kind of advertising, and then also, uh, as I say, um, targeting those institutions and organizations, making it clear where they're, where they're coming from. Um, maybe I'll let you, if you have yeah, I'll take, the other... I'll, I'll, I'll take the first and the third question. Um, I, love the fir I love the first question. Um, such a great point. So uh, I could not uh, agree more. I think that micro practices of collectivity, such as uh, you're describing, where people get together, do things in common, have concrete experiences of what that gives them both materially, food is a great example, but also emotionally, are absolutely central. There are a variety of extremely, in my view, smart theorists who say that those micro practices are the foundation, or to use the metaphor, uh, the soil from which, uh, uh, from which macro policies grow. If you do not cultivate those experiences, those emotions, and those values, you can't build an edifice. It won't grow like a progressive vision of collectivity won't grow in that land, uh, in that soil. So I think it's way more important in many ways. My students might kill me as a political philosopher, but I think it's more important to have those experiences than it is to have lectures about generosity and social contract and, and the collective good. So um, couldn't agree more. All right, great question. Uh, I think it limits us in lots of ways. That's why I think it's super important that we have people like Chris Hedges that pushes us really far on the on the on the big philosophical image. I think it's also really important for us to push ourselves like Shane respond to that question. Why the heck can't we imagine a more democratic media environment where money does not equal how much time you get, right? That is a totally uh, a constructed social decision. There's no justification for it. Okay, so very quickly, um, I just wanted to remind you that the doors open at 8.30 tomorrow morning for, um, that's half an hour before the first session, for coffee and fresh pastries. Please bring your own mug. And also, if you haven't heard, um, the, the reading of Arno Kopecky's new book, The Oil Man and the Sea, is at 7 o'clock tonight in Dewey's Lounge in the old power plant. Um, so, most importantly, um, I'd like to thank the Parkland Institute for this very important opportunity. I'm happy to have been a part of it. And, uh, and to our fabulous presenters for jamming such a huge amount of content into this short time. So thank you very much.